years ago, a group of pilgrims crossed from Asia to North America over a land bridge. During the last century, a new wave of pilgrims crossed over a different kind of bridge, bringing Buddhism from east to west. Members of this morning's panel are the descendants of that wave of pilgrims who continue to build bridges between east and west, between past and present, between Theravada, Mahayana, and Tibetan traditions. You could call them bridge Buddhists, who are charged with the task of finding common ground on the rich and varied traditions of Buddhism. The moderator for this panel on Building Bridges Across Traditions is the director of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, Reverend Hung Shu. Sangha members from the Theravada, Mahayana, and Tibetan traditions, we're in a position to represent the state of the Dharma in the West in the year 2019. The idea is that Buddhism began in Asia, but has now come over a bridge to the West, and representatives of authentic Buddhist traditions from Southeast Asia, from East Asia, and from the Himalayas have all arrived in the West, passed on their practices and their stories, to a second generation of what we might call bridge Buddhists. Here we are. That is to say, our teachers were the pioneers and the pilgrims who built one end of that bridge from Asia to the West. Our job now as second generation teachers and practitioners is to plant our end of the bridge firmly in Western soil. We cross back over to Asia to refresh our awareness of the rich traditions we come from, and then we return to introduce what we have learned to the new generation here in the West. Here we are in your global Buddhist gathering here in Berkeley. We have available to us, as never before, all the resources of the Dharma. That is to say, the sutras, the practices, the traditions, the languages, the food, the music, and also the cultural baggage of the past comes with us as well. Some of that tradition will not translate into the cultures of the West. Some traditional practices, such as Zazen, Vipassana, chanting, have already taken root in the new topsoil of North America, Europe, Latin America. Deepening and enriching these practices of the Dharma so they survive the challenges of the 21st century depends upon you all, this next generation of Buddhist practitioners. So other practices like devotion perhaps will take more time to customize them before they become ours. So mindfulness has now been introduced to millions uh, as one aspect of Buddhist practice. And we are here, tellers of sacred stories, stories of liberation from suffering. Many of us are hyphenated Buddhists. We might be Jewish Buddhists, known as Jew Buddhists. <laughs> Some of us are Methodist Buddhists. Some of us are scholar Buddhists. Some of us are Pentecostal Buddhists. Is that fair? <laughs> we are male and female, Asian, African, European. What we share is a passport to the Dharma realm and a visa to the Dharma. A love of the insights the cultivation reveals and a wish to share the gifts of compassion, the sense of connection with living beings, and the security of refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So, having introduced our topic today, uh, I'm going to introduce each speaker in turn, and we have eight minutes apiece. I'm going to be tough on you. Ding! We're going to, number one, talk to the story of what in your Buddhist tradition inspired you to devote full-time to this cultivation. And two, what part of your tradition do you plan to leave on the other side of the bridge, so to speak, and not introduce to the West? What part of your tradition is the most challenging and needing of innovation as we introduce the Dharma to the next generation of students? So that's the plan. 
And I'm going to start on my left to introduce to you Venerable Dr. Panyawati. Now her bio, we, we could do the eight minutes telling your story, but I want to let you uh, tell the story. She is a former Christian pastor. Uh, she is the co-founder and co-abbot of Embracing Simplicity Hermitage in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And she is now the co-director of Heartwood Refuge, a new intentional community. President of the Treasure Human Life Foundation. She's ordained in both Theravada and Chan traditions. And she is contemplative and empowered for compassion service. Um, the biography goes on to in some of the highlights. Uh, she has created villages in India with approximately 30,000 people living there, uh, providing micro grants and wells and books and improving their schools. Uh, my own experience with Dr. Panyawati is going to visit Hartwood Hermitage and uh, uh, embracing simplicity in Hermitage and meeting face to face the young high school graduates who, before she found them in the bus station, lost and on the edge. She brought them in to her community, embraced them, put them through high school, and got them jobs in her own bakery. A vegan, gluten-free, gluten-free baby. <laughs> so this is uh, Dr. Venerable Anyuati. Thank you. Something that I have is old. You know, when there's a good story, people like to continue it on. But we keep uh, advancing. We keep moving on. There's so many people, so many needs that need to be met uh, around the world that we can't like just do one thing. We have to do uh, many things. All right, today, I know I'm supposed to be representing the Theravada states. So I, so I think I got you a little bit mixed up because I have on, on my Tibetan blouse today. And I did that uh, particularly uh, by intention because we can get so fixed in our views, so fixed and so established in our way of doing things, our way of understanding things. But the, the expansive mind, the oceanic mind, can embrace all of these and move beyond the linguistics or even the outer accoutrements and come to know what is really true. We, th we think in terms of our uh, who we are today as what we should be and what we should represent, but I think I must have lived uh, 10,000 times before. And so there's something from the past that kept impacting me that wasn't present with me now. And it's like that with me around the traditions and understanding the traditions. We use words to describe things. We use words to uh, take us into a direct experience. And if we come from this country or that country, we may use certain words. And we may apply them in certain ways. But if we consider that we've lived 100,000 times, I have all kinds of ways to express things or to understand things or to do things. And so we shouldn't just be stuck, I feel on who we are today in this, in, this, in this life. And so in that sense, I have not fared well in any one tradition. I think there's this booyana for me, you know, um, and that, that uh, pressing in to the fully awakened, expansive mind. But I've used each tradition to help awaken or rekindle or make it plain some part of, of, of how to do this that has been useful to me. And so we talk about keeping our sex, sex, not sex, S-E-S, -S, <laughs> sex, S-E-C-T-S, -S, of keeping them pure, not mixing. But I think for me, the purity is the, is the blending of them because they help me to understand different things at different times, different situations, different applications, and certainly different people. Uh, so, um, I don't know, what are we talking about? Moving <laughs> <laughs> on, you can't go wrong. <laughs> First question, what brought you into full-time commitment? Second question, what are the challenges? Are we getting into the 21st century? Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, I came, uh, I, I, when I run into my Christian friends, they asked me, when did, I, when did I leave God and when did I leave Christianity? I never left. I'm, I'm still on the path. I don't care whether you call it an anity, an ism, an is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just on the path, the way leading upward. And so in different times, it takes us into different, uh, uh, there are different things that we aspire to know. You can't, 
answer a question that hasn't been answered. But I was asking questions. So the answers availed themselves to me. The answers came. And part of those answers uh, required that I step outside what I already knew. Uh, it wasn't that I rejected, but I felt there must be more. And what I already knew, and I had to open myself to what I didn't know, what I considered foreign, what I was told not to look at. But if I had looked at everything available to me and I still felt something was lacking, where do you go? You go to what you don't know. So I went there. So right away somebody introduced me. I mean, just as soon as the thought, there's the action coming at you. Somebody comes down to me and offers me a Buddhist book. But actually, it was, this was my first book, and it was a book on dependent origination. It had the wheel of life with the mind holding the teeth, and, and, the, and all the animals on the wheel. I, I put up the sign of the cross. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that. Uh, and, and it took 18 years for the Dharma to come back around to me. So even when the Dharma was calling me, I was not ready for it. But 18 years later, after I'd gone through everything, gone through unity, gone through you, you, gone to, um, uh, I, I was, Taoism was the last one that I was in, and I loved it so much, and I was asking my, my great master a question, and, uh, questions, and he finally looked at me and said, Buddhism is for you. I said, no, 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 I'm not interested in that. He said, no, Buddhism is for you. And basically, he was kicking me out. He was sending me to the great, he was sending me to the great teacher. And I'm so grateful for that because intellectually I could get a lot of this and I could spit it right back out, but I didn't really understand it. But he sent me to, to the Buddha and the Dharma, to this, the Dharma started, you know, I was Pentecostal all night, all right, so you do that. <laughs> so the Dharma began to break it down for me in a way that I could really understand it. You know, giving a baby milk is good, but you try to give them meat, you'll kill them. And so I started with this milk and gradually moved on to Pablum and gradually moved on until I can, I can, I can eat meat. I mean, you know what I mean. I can, <laughs> I can digest. Uh, and so this is what brought me. I never left the path. From the beginning of my life, I always had a vision and a view for something and I didn't know what it was. But the Dharma has brought me to the what I know is the path of completion. The only challenge I had was with the, mostly with the, uh, the, uh, um, the man, woman thing. You know, but I'd gone through that in Christianity. You don't have to keep repeating the same lessons. And so I understood what needed to be understood with that. And I just moved forward in my understanding with a lot of respect because there were times that I had a different view about things. We can change. And so I just let them be however they want to be, and I just continue to be as I am. And now they're catching up. I think that's so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, our Buddhist sects go in that same direction. Some of the things that we need no instruction on what to do and what not to do. And others we need to imagine ourselves living in our, in our highest and best qualities of being. Can we do that? So some of us study Dharma. Some of these practices, uh, actually we don't study Dharma. We are the Dharma. And so when you bring these together, I think we become a whole and complete lacking in no good thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd like to introduce Venerable Chen Hu to my right. Venerable Chen Hu originally from Taiwan, 